Silver at last shows its shiny upside strength, and gold also flexed its spot price muscles this week. The silver spot price blasted up to close the week around $16.25 per ounce. That's a full Fed note higher than it closed last week. Keep an eye on the $18 and potential $20 price resistance and target levels. Uh, they may be threatened sooner than uh, many might think is possible. The spot gold price ended this week up 10 fiat notes, closing at around $1,425 per derivative spot price troy ounce. And as for the gold silver ratio, that fell hard this week from 93 down to 88 ounces of derivative silver to acquire one theoretical ounce of derivative gold. This week, we're not bringing on any guests. Rather, we're going to put this modern silver whale conspiracy and or discussion talk into physical bullying context. Um, we're going to name names and we're going to talk about how many hundreds of millions of silver bullion ounces they've acquired. Uh, we're talking about a modern context too. This is not uh, something from long ago. And we're even going to hear direct from a few of them as they repeat advice they never took and or repeat uh, scapegoatings that they never bothered to investigate or conveniently they just never address the uh, actual details. Well, that's all happening after this brief message from our show sponsor. Yeah, we're going silver whale hunting. SDBullion.com is a high volume physical gold, silver, and precious metal dealer. Founded in March 2012 with the goal of providing the lowest cost bullion available, SD Bullion has become one of the largest US based precious metal dealers and is regularly recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of America's fastest growing companies. We are committed to being your trusted source for low cost, highest quality investment grade bullion products. Visit sdbullion.com for more information. Hello and welcome to this week's Metals and Markets Wrap. I'm your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. This past week, we had some strong fiat price action for not only gold bullion again, but also finally some upside action in the silver derivative markets. While doing an interview this past Tuesday with Chris Marcus of Arcadia Economics, I was asked to give my thoughts on a recent article written by Alistair McLeod published on Gold Money Insights entitled, A Whale is Accumulating Silver Futures. Caught flat-footed on the question, I have since gone and read Alistair's article, which essentially suggests that China, via JP Morgan as their brokering agent, is acquiring silver both increasingly in derivative form on the COMEX Silver Futures Exchange, and also perhaps too for future industrial purposes, as that nation still remains the largest manufacturer for the world. And as we all likely know, the monetary commodity of silver is used second only to crude oil and modern-day goods we use day-to-day. I even briefly glanced at Ted Butler's reaction and then the subsequent back and forth that went on this week. All that's published at silverdoctors.com between those two gentlemen. Now, I've had the pleasure of interviewing and speaking with both Alistair McLeod and Ted Butler over the years. And given further, th further thought on the matter, I've come to the conclusion it doesn't matter, at least in the long term, whose speculative theories are perhaps accurate here. For silver bullion stackers with long-term frameworks, the coming performance for silver to the upside is a bigger story than either J.P. Morgan or China. It will be more so a story about the greatest gold bull market the world has ever witnessed, and quite likely the brief but incredible performance silver bullion achieves in the mania portion of what I bet is to come. I wanted today's podcast to be simply a general overview for silver bullion bulls about verifiable facts looking backwards. Also be a few colorful allegations mixed in, I promise you that. But you can then go and do your own research and perhaps drop some of the preconceived notions you may have had coming into today's podcast. We're going to run through where the modern silver market has been throughout this full fiat currency era from 1970 to today, all in the context of the largest verifiable silver bullion whales of modern time. Who's amassed the biggest silver bullion holdings in the modern era? And perhaps what were and are their motivations now? Finally, I'll conclude with the main context and potential valuation drivers that the silver bullion market finds itself in today. To begin, we start with the one and only Hunt Brothers. 
During the 1970s and early 1980 devaluations of the then somewhat recent fully fiat Federal Reserve note, what most people still call U.S. dollars without definitions or context, there were three trust fund oil billionaire brothers who went long silver bullion in a big way to the tune of amassing some 100 million ounces of silver bullion. The problem was, one in particular never took his own advice. More on that later. The Hunt brothers' motivations were probably a mix of both underlying fear and greed, the fear of loss and the lust for more. First and foremost, the Hunt brothers began buying silver bullion in the early 1970s, back when it was around one fiat and a half dollars per troy ounce. That was around the same time President Nixon lied to us again, claiming that we were suspending the U.S. dollar's final tie to gold, temporarily. I suppose we must define what temporarily means. It was also only a handful of years before confiscated U.S. bullion coin savings were again re-legalized among the constitutional U.S. public. U.S. citizens who were seeking wealth protection from various overnight devaluations of the freshly fiat U.S. dollar and building price inflations in the first half of the 1970s, they pretty much had to run to silver bullion or other commodity plays if they were hedging large swaths of capital savings. Reading between the lines of the still NFL franchise-owning Hunt family, it's pretty easy to assume the 1970s Hunt brothers distrusted and probably disliked many in the banking and political establishment at the time. Being John Birch Society followers likely meant that places like New York City, Washington, D.C., they were not very comforting to the Hunt brothers, even as they were getting very wealthy from the general 1970s commodity price boom. And while the Hunt brothers, too, often had many of the trappings of wealthy elitists, such as personal high fine art collections, awaiting trust funds compounding capital for later release to their pockets, and thoroughbred race horse ventures, the Hunt brothers were unlikely to ever be accepted in a blue blood Wall Street banking clique. The Hunt brothers probably inherently felt more insecure around East Coast longer legacy wealth than they ever did around newer burgeoning commodity dynasties back then in Texas and in Oklahoma. Often when supposed financial market experts want to discuss inflationary pressure from the 1970s and early 1980s, they drag out the Hunt brothers scapegoat as an example. If anyone subscribes to this following theory and or parakeets it, you can pretty much guess they've never done any research and quite likely they do this in other areas of their life. The dumbed down Hunt Brothers mantra goes something like this. Three billionaire Texans bought all the silver in the world and therefore caused an otherwise unexplainable $50 an ounce US dollar silver price in January 1980. Well, that's perhaps how a naive child might suggest silver reached $50 an ounce in 1980. The truth we know is a hell of a lot more interesting than that scapegoat tale. First and foremost, from 1970 through 1980, virtually every commodity we use in trade, they multipled many-fold at one point or another in their typical fiat U.S. dollar numeraire. Conversely, those commodities valued in gold or silver bullion, they got cheaper in value over this same time frame. Put in simpler words, if you held gold or silver over that decade, virtually everything got cheaper. Now, as for the size and scope of the Hunt Brothers 1980 silver hoard, it's estimated to have peaked at 100 million troy ounces. It's not really much of a silver market corner, given that it's estimated that there were some 12 billion ounces of silver above ground in 1980. The problem was, these Hunt brothers, near the January 1980 peak in silver prices, forgot to take their own Loan Brothers sage advice. Never gamble on silver prices using leverage, and fickle could vanish in the air fiat credit. So come with me now, as it's early January 1980. We're only a few weeks away from when the comics rigs the rules to pull the rug out from the Hunt Brothers' over-leveraged silver derivatives position. Hey, Nelson Bunker Hunt, uh, are you worried at all that you could get financially hurt with this rapidly escalating silver price if it goes the wrong way on you? Uh, you could if you did it on credit. Uh, I think in, uh, in investing in anything, if you do it on credit, of course, if the price comes down, then you're in serious trouble. If you do it as an investment, uh, paying uh, cash for it, then I think you're, over the long pull, you're in pretty good shape. Once it all of a sudden became roll rigged liquidation orders only for silver futures contracts on the COMEX, the silver spot price fell like a rock. Going from $50 to $10 an ounce roughly in only a few weeks of time, 
the Federal Reserve had to coordinate a then massive $1.1 billion bailout for the over-leveraged Hunt brothers, and the scapegoating was on, full stop. The main reason the Hunt brothers' names got so famous was because they foolishly went levered long silver futures contracts on the we can change our rules anytime we like derivative betting comics commodity exchange. Now had the Hunts simply taken their own advice, history would likely have unfolded differently. But make no mistake, when the Comex discontinued silver futures contract betters from effectively going long silver, the only place for the price to go was down. More than likely, many silver futures contract specs at the time slid over to the platinum and palladium pits. It's the same ones still price discovering on the derivative betting NYMEX commodity exchange today. In the first quarter of 1980, all four precious metals within months of one another had reached then new all-time nominal price highs in fiat US dollars. The hunts had little to absolutely no influence over record-setting gold, platinum, and palladium prices. They didn't have anything to do with the near quadrupling of crude oil prices from 1978 to 1980. This was a crisis of confidence in the fiat U.S. dollar. It was stagflation, and we might end up seeing something like this again in our near futures. Listener side note, I will be soon speaking with someone who worked for the Hunt Brothers, former futures brokerage bank, you know, the guys who lent the Hunt Brothers fiat currency credit to go out and speculate on the long side and silver futures contracts. We'll likely learn more details about and hear more first person hand accounts of what went down and why early next month with this coming guest. The silver scapegoating of the Hunt Brothers is an interesting story that rabbit holes really deeply. It's interesting and it tells us a lot about our recent financial history and more importantly, half truth financial media and slander, how it holds up especially if had true stories are childlike enough to believe without any critical thought or research. They can stick around for a very long time. The next largest modern day silver bullion hoarder is both a 2008 bailout beneficiary and a regular gold bug antagonist. That's Warren Buffett and his highly successful Berkshire Hathaway company. Warren and his cuddly curmudgeon, Charlie Munger, they and their holding company bet silver bullion harder and amassed their 129.7 million troy ounce silver bullion hoard in a much faster time frame than the Hunt brothers ever did, with the former record-setting silver bullion position being only about 77% of silver bug warrants. The position was acquired in two troughs with buy-in prices of early 1997 of about $4.38 per ounce and early 1998 of $6.05 per ounce and all of course that was all paid for in fully fiat U.S. dollars. Here is Warren and his Berkshire boy, uh, Charlie Munger, at the 1998 conference with some of their most adoring fans and shareholders. You'll hear and see, if you're watching, and now 100 billionaire Buffett and his sidekick Charlie react when Inquisitor asks about this thin record-sized silver bullion position. You'll hear how Warren was obviously the silver bull. Munger would likely prefer guaranteed sweetheart or crony capitalist moat-protected investments over silver bullion speculations he has less control over. Either way, it's pretty interesting to hear this look back in past, 1998, here comes Warren Buffett getting asked about his silver. Good uh, morning, or afternoon, actually. Uh, my name's Matt Schwab, I'm from New York, Pound Ridge, New York. I actually had a question about uh, the silver purchase last year. Um, when you announced it, you said that you believe that supply and demand fundamentals would only be established at a higher price, re-established at a higher price. I was just wondering if you could go into more detail about what some of those fundamentals are. I mean, we've read a lot about like battery technology and some other things. Yeah, we have no inside information about great new uses for silver or anything of the sort, but the, the situation, and you can, you can get these figures and they're not precise, but I think they're in general, uh, they're, they're generally accurate. You can, you can see from looking at the numbers that uh, aggregate demand, primarily from photography, from industrial uses, and from ornamental jewelry type uses, uh, is close, um, call it 800 million plus ounces a year. And there are 500 million or so ounces being produced of silver annually, uh, although there will be more coming on in the next couple of years. There's more coming on right now. 
Um, however, most of that silver is produced as a byproduct in the mining of gold or copper or lead zinc, so that since it's a byproduct, it's not responsive to not very responsive to price changes because obviously if you've got a copper mine and you get a little silver out of it, you're much more interested in the price of copper than silver. So you have 500 million ounces or so of mine production and you have 150 million ounces or so of uh, reclaimed silver, a large part of which relates to to the uses in photography. Uh, so there's been a gap in recent years of um, perhaps 150 million ounces, but none of these figures are precise which has been filled by an inventory of bullion above ground, which may have been a billion two or more ounces a few years back, but which has been depleted. And no one knows the exact figures on this, but there's no question that the bullion inventory has been depleted significantly, which means that the present price for silver does not produce an equilibrium between supply as measured by newly mined silver plus re reclaimed silver and, and usage. And that eventually uh, something will happen to change that picture. Now it could be reduced usage, it could be increased supply, or it could be a change in price. And that imbalance is sufficiently large, that even though there is some new production coming on and there's the threat of digital imaging that will reduce silver usage perhaps in the future in photography. But we think that that gap uh, has is wide enough so that it will continue to deplete inventories, bullion inventories, to the point where a new price is needed to establish equilibrium. And because of the byproduct nature, which makes the supply inelastic, and because of the nature of demand, which is relatively inelastic, uh, that we don't think that that price change would necessarily be, be minor. It's interesting because silver has been artificially influenced for a long time. You saw that movie about uh, you know, it was William Jennings Bryan, who was editor of the Omaha World Herald and a congressman from, from Nebraska, and whose brother was governor of Nebraska, uh, who was the big silver man. And they used to talk 16 to 1. Uh, the, the 16 to 1 ratio, I think, goes back to Isaac Newton when he was master of the mint. Charlie will know all about that because he's our Newtonian uh, uh, expert here. Uh, and, uh, but that, that ratio had kind of mystical significance for a while. It didn't really mean anything. Uh, um, and in 1934, the government passed a, an act called the Silver Purchase Act of, surprisingly, 1934, which set an artificially high price for silver at that time, when production and usage was much less. And the, and the government, the U.S. government ended up accumulating two billion ounces of silver. Now, this was at a time when demand was a couple hundred million ounces a year, so you're talking 10 years supply. So there was an artificially high price for a while, by the 19, early 1960s, that became an artificially low price of $1.29. And at that time, I could see the inventories of the, of the U.S. government being depleted, uh, somewhat akin to what inventories are being depleted now. And despite the fact that Lyndon Johnson and the administration said they would not demonetize silver, they did demonetize it, and silver went up substantially. That was the last purchase we had of silver, but I've kept track of the figures ever since. The Hunt brothers caused a great amount of silver to be converted into bullion form, including a lot of silver coins. So they again increased the supply in a very big way by their action in pushing the price way up to the point where people started melting it down. So you had these dislocations in silver over a 60 plus year period, which has caused the price to be affected by these huge inventory accumulations and, and, uh, and reductions. And we think right now that uh, we thought last summer when we started buying it that at the price we bought it that that was not an equilibrium price and that uh, sooner or later and we didn't think it was imminent because we don't wait till things are imminent uh, uh, you know we, we were going to buy a lot of silver we didn't want to buy so much as to really disrupt the market however we had no intention of uh, of uh, replaying any any hunt scenario so we wanted to be sure we didn't buy that much silver but we liked it uh, Charlie well, I think this whole episode will have about as much impact on Berkshire Hathaway's future as Warren's bridge playing. <laughs> We've got a line of activity where once every 30 or 40 years you can do something employing 2% of assets. This is not a big deal for 
no. Berkshire. The fact that it keeps Warren amused and uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't and like not it. doing counterproductive things. It makes me feel makes better it, about it makes me feel better about all those pictures that people take over the weekend. They, they, they all use a little bit of silver. At least it shows. <laughs> at least it shows something that teaches an interesting lesson. Think of the discipline it takes to think about something for three or four decades, waiting for a chance to employ 2% of your assets. I'm afraid that's the way we are. <laughs> it means there'll be some dull stretches. Right. Yeah, it's less than a billion dollars in silver. It's $15 billion in Coke. You know, it's... Uh... It's a non-event. It's five billion in American Express. I mean, the it, 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 it is close to a non-event, but if you see it there, uh... the Berkshire Silver Hoard produced some fiat profits for the holding company, but there are some fishy circumstances around the timeline as to why those near 130 million troy ounces were sold so early and so quickly in early 2006, around ten dollars and thirteen dollars per troy ounce. Given silver's eventually near doubling by the spring of 2008. And then it's repeated rise uh, to $50 uh, fiat dollars per ounce uh, within five years time frame of their sale. Um, it's kind of interesting. I've written a blog on the matter at SD Bullion. For brevity, I'm just simply going to backlink that story in the show notes so you can see how SLB got its silver bullion probably in the beginning of 2006 from this hoard. As well, you're going to see what Buffett's silver buying spree did to silver lease rates in 1997. They flat out exploded. And finally, the fishy accusations as to why the silver hoard got sold to the derivative silver bullion bank slush fund SLV, more than likely. Moving on to the all-time modern record silver bullion hoarder. Uh, it is the bank a lot of people love to hate in the silver industry, none other than J.P. Morgan. Inheriting the failed bankrupt Bear Stearns Silver Comics short position in the spring of 2008, after Silver had run hard to the interim price top of around $21 per ounce and handed Bear Stearns losses so large it likely exacerbated its somehow shocking failure, the team at J.P. Morgan likely profited handsomely as Silver spot prices fell from $21 to just below $9 an ounce by late 2008. Personally, I remember buying some Silver Maple Leaf coin cases for around six grand a piece, much in thanks to the derivative price discovery market's failure to actually track what was going on in the real world of physical silver bullion buying and investing. From that near $9 uh, price point low in early 2009 into the spring of 2011, silver prices did a five multiple, more than a five multiple, and you can bet JP Morgan learned a lot over that time frame. Once the silver price got mowed down in late April 2011, JP Morgan's comics warehouse was quickly approved and they went from being the custodian of no semi-transparent silver comics ounces to now having amassed over 153.7 million troy ounces in their comics warehouse to date. This was a slower acquisition than Charlie and Warren Buffett's Berkshire hoard, uh, but the circumstances are also strange, inviting much speculation over these many years as to why J.P. Morgan keeps acquiring such large concentrated silver derivative positions while also seemingly going long and or acting on customers' behalf going long in silver bullion. The largest motivations for J.P. Morgan acquiring both silver bullion and likely large amounts of unpublished gold bullion too, they're likely twofold. It's greed-based profit bonuses on trading the volatile derivatives, as well, ultimately, perhaps fear-based survival of the organization itself. The Bank for International Settlements, they have a working group, uh, politely called the Financial Stability Board, or the FSB, uh, that has been running around the world ever since the financial crisis in 2008 and uh, in 2014 I believe it got the G20 to sign on to supranational legislation calling for bank bail-ins and not bank bailouts the next time some listed globally systematically important bank or listed financial institution goes bankrupt. At the top of the explicit too big to fail uh, bank list uh, by the Financial Stability Board it remains alone at the top and you guess who they are. J.P. Morgan Chase. Given that gold's now a tier one asset, it would make sense for J.P. Morgan to scramble and hold some physical gold bullion just in case some bad derivative bet somewhere or some bad derivative chain somewhere goes off and they end up possibly going under. The problem is physical gold bullion in large volumes is being gobbled up by central banks at the moment. 
to the record size tune of levels not since seen since the last public record time frame in which governments were rigging the gold price when it backfired in their face in the 1960s. That's called the London Gold Pool. There was a collapse. Uh, a lot of the confiscated U.S. citizens' gold from 1933, uh, we lost a lot of that while they were rigging the gold price. About half of all the gold reserves in the United States went out the window because of that. By J.P. Morgan having such a record large semi-transparent COMEX silver bullion position, one in which we don't fully know yet for whom it's acting for, with J.P. Morgan currently under U.S. Department of Justice investigation for manipulating the precious metal derivative markets for handfuls of years, one could surmise uh, pretty easily that greed might be at play. By having such a large dominant physical silver position on the COMEX, it's easy to tell the CFTC to pound sand if they ever ask about J.P. Morgan's outsized silver futures contract derivative position. By having the largest positions in both silver COMEX derivatives and slim fractional reserve silver bullion underlying the total notional trading that goes on on the COMEX silver market annualized, J.P. Morgan can theoretically throw around and dictate rapid price movements virtually in any direction it may deem fit for itself in the COMEX silver futures market. In this week's show notes, I'm going to leave you one recent and classic example of the kind of bonus fiat currency action that can be made in very short time frames by simply moving derivative price discovery markets with concentration to favor one's bets in silver to the up and or downside. This particular example is to the downside. Uh, but Lord knows, it could be to the upside at some point. So keep an eye on that. Disregarding all this silver bullion uh, whale talk and all that stuff, it's, it's more important to keep this longer-term bullion bull market in perspective. Stay with me on these facts. The world's using about 800 million new ounces of silver per year. Silver demand and applications appear to be only growing industrially and within newly discovered scientific applications, it seems, every year. Yet silver to many in the investing world, it's also money. So much so that only a handful of years ago, about a fourth of all new line silver that came out of the ground went into silver bullion investor hands. This was during a time when we were not having a financial crisis, when fiat currencies were not devaluing with high velocity yet. This world we live in has over $245 trillion in record level debts, and some 13 of which are negative yielding, absolutely lunacy. The system's not sound, and no matter what the fiat price propaganda says, we've been seeing the last handful of years some of the craziest things ever in the financial market. Most of it has been masked by debt, and much of the debt and unfunded promises made, they're not going to get paid in full. There's easily over 300 trillion fiat US dollars in supposed asset values around the world, as every record piece of debt is alternatively someone else's counterparty risk-laden asset. Think of all the arable land, the real estate, all the fiat currencies, all the businesses and property you've ever seen with your own eyes, everything that has value that's owned in the world. Silver bullion inventories are dwarfed by that. Silver bullion inventories these days are probably around 4 billion troy ounces. That takes into account all annual fee-laden silver ETF holdings, commodity exchange silver holdings and their fractional reserve nonsense, and private investor silver bullion buying from the mid-1980s onwards. Total silver bullion valuations, they're currently a grain of sand. I mean, it's like $100 billion tops. And it, we're talking about a beach awash with trillions of debt, currency, and credit bubbles, and only a tiny pile of physical gold likely to also continually increasing in value in the decades to come. So a silver whale is not coming to save nor drown your long-term silver bullion position. The current limited downside versus the explosive upside for silver ahead it's about as clear a trade as, you know, even recently deceased Nelson Bunker Hunt could have hopefully made intelligently this time around. You just buy and hold a prudent silver bullion position for the long term. Freaking simple. No silver whale is going to make silver values get to where they are destined. And that wasn't the way it was in 1980 nor in 2011 in, when, we, when we reached $50 an ounce. It wasn't because one silver whale went long. That wasn't it. It was a crowd. It was then and most likely again going to be the predictable result, the cause and then the effect of this deranged financial system we've allowed to grow around us collectively. And when that moment comes where the crowd rushes, you'll start to see silver go to nutty valuation levels. I look forward to taking that wild ride with you listeners ahead. And thanks for tuning in to this week's SD Metals and Markets Wrap. Check out the show notes for more backlinks and extra videos I put in there to make it worth your while to go check it out. 
And that's it. Until next week, all the best to you and yours.